Thank you, Joe. Um, I apologize about my voice. I'm recovering from a, a little bit of a cold here in Michigan this week. So, good afternoon, good morning, wherever you're at in the United States. Um, today, I'm going to give a little bit of uh, background on nutrient management practices, technology choices that we're making in Michigan. Um, but I'm going to give it again from our perspective. And so, for the few, first few slides, I'm going to go through some of the regulations and. Uh, shifting agricultural scene here in Michigan, and then uh, I'll close off with a, a, a brief discussion of some of the innovative or, or different things that we're doing in the state or our producers are doing to to uh, maximize nutrient management here in the state. So, oops. There we go. So I think before we get too far into the discussion of nutrient management, it, it's good to have some perspective and some understanding on uh, the regulations and the regulatory climate that's driving the decisions we're making. And, and here you can see um, six different regulations or, or different policies that are having a pretty direct impact uh, on decisions that we make when it comes to animal agriculture in the state. The first one and the, the, the oldest of uh, these policies that have been in place in the state is the Right to Farm Act. And it's a, it's a voluntary act. Uh, I'm going to spend a few minutes on that in the following slides. Uh, that's really what's driven driven our environmental and our nutrient management and our manure management uh, vision here in the state for uh, the last 20 plus years. Uh, the nutrient man or the, the National Pollution Discharge Elimination System or NPDES permit is, is something that's come on and it's a, a national program driven through EPA. Um, it's a regulatory and mandated program for uh, concentrating animal feeding operations, and, and I'm sure most states have had a lot of experience now with the NPDES. Um, but I'll talk a little bit about that. Here in the state, we have um, about 200 permitted uh, CAFOs operating. We do have several uh, facilities that have applied and granted no potential to discharge. Those are mostly uh, poultry-type facilities that have very dry dry manure and uh, that are primarily exporting or moving that manure off-farm. Uh, as, a, as a dry fertilizer or the compost additive. We also have some non-contact process water discharges, and this would be primarily um, plate coolers. So farms that are operating, uh, dairies that are operating plate coolers to chill their milk, um, if they have excess water uh, beyond what the cattle can drink or beyond what they can use as process water on the farm, uh, rather than put that clean water into a manure storage, uh, they've actually gone to, to, to discharging that back to fresh water streams. Essentially, the water is still clean. The only thing that's happened to it is its temperature has gone from groundwater temperature uh, to something greater than that as it, as it was used to cool milk. Uh, then we have a groundwater permit, and this is, uh, doesn't generally come into play on our livestock farms. However, it does have some significant impact on the size of our farms, uh, and I'll talk a little bit about that in, in future. Um, the groundwater wells, again, uh, water use is, is becoming a very um, main discussion point in the state, and so we are doing some groundwater reporting, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Bodies of dead animals, how we manage our dead animal or our animal mortalities uh, is, is regulated, and we've got several options for that in, in documenting that needs to be done. And then to some extent, we do have some air permitting. Uh, it's mainly on incinerators, uh, if flares, engines, boilers, so it's a pretty small amount of permits that we have related to to livestock in the state, but it does impact some swine and uh, any farm or facility that's operating a digester. So with that, uh, move forward a little bit. In, in 1981, the state enacted uh, the Michigan Right to Farm Act. And this act really kind of set the, the tone for the state as far as the, where, where we've gone to and where we're at today when it comes to um, sustainable and environmentally friendly agriculture in the state. And, and this act was really meant to protect farms and farmers from nuisance complaints from, from neighbors. And so whether it's an odor complaint uh, or the fact that uh, the farmer is spreading manure next to my, in a field next to my house and I just don't like the sight of it, um, it was meant to, to really provide some protection for, to, to farmers uh, from just frivolous complaints that, you know, while they may have a, a short-term impact on the the life of a neighbor, they're not something that's normally deemed inappropriate or outside of the, the normal bounds of agriculture. So this, this act, a little bit more in detail, but you know, it does, it lays out a groundwork for investigating complaints. Um, if it's considered or deemed by the Department of Agriculture, or now the Department of Rural Development and Agriculture in the state, if it's deemed to be a normal agricultural practice, 
the case is closed uh, and there's no further action. If, if it's verified that, that the farm was practicing something that was not um, within the guidelines of normal agriculture, they're given an opportunity 30 days to correct that. Again, unverified complaints, there's no further action. The, the Act also provides some protection uh, when it comes to neighborhood disputes, and that is if a farm gets three unverified complaints from a single citizen, uh, it could result in, re in, in legal action against the complainant, and, and that legal action would actually come from the Department of Agriculture. To this date, that's never uh, have happened or, or been carried out, but it is there and it is uh, something that does give, give a little bit more weight uh, against having unverified complaints. The Act was, was kind of re, revitalized uh, in 2010 or, or modified slightly in that it pre, pre, the Act was, was uh, set to, to preempt any local ordinances, regulation, and resolution. In the, in the 90s, we, as, as agriculture and farm size started to grow, uh, there was a lot of townships and, and local ordinances placed that would limit, to, limit the size of agricultural livestock facilities uh, or try and exclude those altogether. And so the, the legislators went back modified the Rights Farm Act and, and, pre, and, and created a statewide act that preempted any local ordinances, local regulations or resolutions. That has been tested several times um, and, and has shown that, that in, in stood up in the court of law that the act does supersede all those local ordinances. Um, in 2009, the act was modified once more and that it did give local ordinances the opportunity to, to preempt agriculture but only when approved by the Ag Commission. So if a, if a township uh, wanted to go back and restrict the number of animals to a certain number, 7, 10, 25, uh, they could now, they can now do that. They just have to have it approved by the Agricultural Commission for the state. One of the main things that came out of the Right to Farm Act was what we call generally accepted agriculture and management practices. The GAMPs, uh, and here you see uh, a list of the GAMPs that we currently have in place in the state today, really define what are normal agricultural practices. The ones when it comes to nutrient management that we're most interested in are manure management utilization, which has been on the book since 1988. Uh, nutrient utilization does have some influence, but it's more focused on uh, commercial fertilizer uses. In 2000, uh, we, we, in, we adopted the site selection odor control for new and expanding livestock facilities, and that really provided guidelines for how we go about locating uh, new facilities or what we need to do uh, to satisfy neighborhood concerns regarding expansion of existing facilities. And so there's a lot of emphasis on social considerations in the site selection. Uh, it focuses on setbacks and making sure that uh, there's proper setback from any livestock facilities to property lines and existing uh, structures or public uh, facilities that are in the area. Also is, is very focused on, on setbacks from water and, and, and wells as well. It provided a, a mechanism uh, for notifying neighbors within the area as prior to an expansion happening, so at least there was some notification before uh, the bulldozers and excavators rolled in. And it also required that farms provide a balanced manure management plan to the department prior to the expansion of that facility or construction of a new facility. And so it really created a very comprehensive uh, review of a site prior to any, any construction going on and then there would be a verification and an authorization by the department to proceed. Now the important thing to remember is the GAMPs are all voluntary. So it's not a requirement that any producer in the state follow these GAMPs. However, it's very highly recommended and, and if there is a nuisance complaint or lawsuit at some point down the line, if the farm has followed and complied with GAMPs, the department will, the Department of Agriculture will support them and defend them uh, in a court hearing or court wait, court case. So kind of looking at this timeline uh, with our GAMPs and, and what I've done here is dropped in, uh, in in black a couple of other things that have really shifted. So in 2001, our CAFOs were required to be permitted and by, um, by 2007, I think is when we completed the permitting of all of our concentrated animal feeding operations. And again, that number is roughly 200 to 220 facilities today. All farms then had a comprehensive nutrient management plan which took our manure management plans and included uh, conservation practices and a lot of other things in those to make a, a complete nutrient management plan that focused on uh, having balanced use of your nutrients. Again, 
Water is becoming more of an issue, and, and in 2009, uh, we adopted and, and were required to have annual water use conservation plans developed for the farms, again, trying to protect our water resources in the state. Uh, this is focused on wells that have a capacity of seven, 70 gallons a minute or more. Uh, we, do, we do have a number of those wells in the state, again, primarily on dairies where, where there's a tremendous amount of water use. And then in 2012, uh, Department of Environmental Quality in the state, which is, the, which is our version of EPA, um, finalized the, the, um, that all manure storages must comply with NRCS 313 practices. So in 2012, all manure storages or waste storage structures on permitted facilities were brought into compliance with the NRCS 313 practice data, standard. Uh, and that included both new facilities as well as existing facilities. So that's kind of the regulatory timeline in the state. Uh, a couple of the important or interesting numbers that come out of these different regulations, and again, the GAMPs, or I'm sorry, the GAMPs started in 1988, the Right to Farm Act 1981, and then our permits really uh, came in about 2000, 2001. Our CAFOs in the state are defined as 1,000 animal units. Uh, that means 700 mature cows. Uh, roughly 2,500 feeder pigs, and then there's certain numbers for the different other livestock species. When it comes to manure application, under our manure utilization GAMP, we are restricted uh, based on phosphorus and nitrogen uh, utilization rates of those crops. So on the second bullet down there, you can see phosphorus is limited at, uh, you can apply phosphorus to a one year or to a two year crop removal on fields that have less than 150 pounds per acre of phosphate as measured with Bray P1. I see, I apologize, it says Bray P2 there. It's actually Bray P1. We can apply, oh, I reverse this all together. That's actually our night, that's the, uh, that is our two year phosphorus limit. On fields that are between 75 and 150 ppm, uh, we're restricted to a, a one-year application rate or a nitrogen limit. Once we exceed 150 parts per million or 300 pounds per acre, no manure can be applied to those fields until the soil tests show that the, the phosphorus values have been brought back under 300 pounds per acre. So that is, is something that's come out of our uh, 1988 manure utilization gap and has been in place since, since that time. The other thing that's of interesting as far as our thresholds go on the groundwater permit once your facility exceeds 5,000 animal units or 3,500 mature dairy cows, you are required to go to a groundwater permit above and beyond your NPDES permit. And this involves improvements to the manure storage structures uh, as well as some groundwater testing and, and some other significant reporting uh, actions. And so to this date, uh, we have no facilities that have achieved this groundwater permit. It's really capped the size of our livestock facilities and um, and kind of that is a main, a main um, uh, ceiling for how, how large our farms will be uh, for the, the time to come. So again, like agriculture all over the United States, Michigan has seen significant changes over the past 100 years. And, and we've seen a very uh, reduced land base uh, compared to what we had in 1920. We're roughly half the size as far as our cropland goes. We've also seen increasing fertilizer use. Uh, again, not quite as much, but from 1970 to, to 2004, uh, we do see about a 50% increase. During that same period, we've also seen significant increases in the number of animals in the state, but a decreasing number of farms. And so we get a concentration of manure production and a concentration of manure nutrients. And, and these things uh, can potentially lead to uh, nutrient imbalance in the state. So since the mid-1990s, we've been evaluating this and looking at it. And in 1994, mid-90s, this is really some of the last data comes out of our, the mid-90s on this. But our average soil test in the state was about 106 pounds per acre of Bray P1. And from the MSU Soil Testing Laboratory, at that time, 50% uh, of the soil tests that were sent into the laboratory required no additional phosphorus to meet uh, crop removal or nutrient recommendations. And so we'd really uh, not saturated this, the, the land, but we had achieved a phosphorus level in the state that didn't require us to use a lot of additional supplemental fertilizers. When we look at it on a statewide basis or balance, uh, without fertilizer, the state is deficient in phosphorus and that we're about 21 pounds per acre deficient. When we factor in commercial fertilizer, we do, we do exceed uh, crop removals and so we have a, a plus 13 on that pounds per acre phosphate. 
about 69 in, in, in 99 about 69 of our 83 counties did have excess phosphate uh, and 15 of those counties exceeded by greater than 22 pounds per acre so again keeping phosphorus under control with the amount of surface water that we have here it is a real focus uh, for the state if we used looked at our manure phosphorus production uh, we could supply roughly a third of 30 to 40 percent of the state's phosphorus crop removal needs Cattle and primarily dairy make up the biggest percentage of our manure phosphorus at 70 percent, uh, followed by swine, and, and the other species are, are much less than that. We can also achieve 10 to 20 percent of our, our nitrogen needs and roughly 20 to 30 percent of the potassium needs from manure. The difficulty with manure is that we have hot spots, um, and on the left there you can see our top dairy counties. Uh, there's two circles that kind of highlight the majority of where or where the majority of our dairy production is. Similarly, we have dense populations of swine uh, in a few counties, uh, primarily to the southern part of the state, and then on the, the right-hand side of the screen there in what we, the area that we call the thumb. And in, in there, we have a lot of, of very concentrated swine, both swine and dairy production. Uh, they are big crop-producing parts of the state, but our crop production exceeds well beyond those areas. The, the, the two sectors that, that house most of our dairy and, and swine make up about a third of our counties, whereas our heavy crop production, which is really in the southern half of what we call the Lower Peninsula, is about half the counties in the state. So we have a lot of, of nutrients that need to be moved into those other crop producing counties. Uh, and the, the primary crop producing county in the state, Saginaw here, is actually a very low uh, animal production area. So again, it's, it's shifting these manure nutrients to areas that crop producers can use those. So the goal of our, our manure management in the state is, of course, to move these nutrients, utilize them in the areas where we need them, but also put them in forms where we can move those, those nutrients to areas that they can be used, uh, where we have heavy crop production but very little animal, animal production. So the goals of our nutrient management and manure management in the state, of course, is to concentrate nutrients, make them easier and more mobile as far as the transportation goes, reduce the volume of, in, in the content of the water that we're hauling when we move manure, and to create rich organic materials and rich organic fertilizers not only provide nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium needs, but also provide uh, carbon to the soil. So the approaches that have been taken by producers in the state, uh, of course, traditional land application uh, is still at the forefront. Uh, direct export it has been very good in certain sectors, and I'll talk about that, as well as the chemical phosphorus separation, and, and uh, we do have one gasification process in the state. On land application, we've seen over the last 15 years, a lot of focus on how to be more efficient at it. And we see a lot more injection now today than we did 10 years ago to control odor. We see a lot more use of nurse tanks and drag lines to efficiently move large volumes of material uh, and, and apply that to fields at an agronomic rate, but also do it very quickly and, and do it without compacting the soils in those fields. So a lot of focus there. You, through the GAMPS program, we also have uh, move to avoiding any manure applications on holidays, uh, near major weekends, and again, those cut down on the social concerns quite a bit and, and really cut down on the nuisance, uh, nuisance complaints related to odor. Direct export is, is a technique that's used very heavily by our poultry industry, primarily turkey and layers. They have, those facilities produce very dry material, uh, less than 20% moisture, that, that it, and it is, uh, sometimes has a a uh, very dry bedding in it that allows that to, to happen. Sometimes it's natural drying in, in long-term storages that are covered. Sometimes it's in mechanical drying systems. But that provides those facilities a potential to export material in a, in a radius of potentially 50 to 100 miles or greater. Uh, the nice thing about this dry material is it's stackable, so we can, we can short-term headland stack that in the state and, and do that within our permits. Uh, and it provides a really good nutrient content. And that, that content, as you see in this table, is very similar to um, what a lot of conventional fertilizers would be. So uh, it's, it's a very valuable material and it's a, a very good marketing material. Chemical phosphorus separation, as I talked last time, is used on, on a few farms in the state and it's a, where an, a metal salt is added to the manure slurry. Uh, more or less, we're, we're pulling those dissolved phosphates that have a negative charge uh, and creating uh, soluble materials that, that uh, or insoluble materials that have a, with the positive charge calcium, iron, and aluminum. And then polymers are used to, to flocculate those or create larger molecules that can be separated. 
And then separating devices there, again, can be done by passive separation, passive settling and clarification, uh, dissolved air flotation, or some sort of mechanical separation device. We do have three systems that have operated in the state in the past 10 years. One DAF system operated for about 18 months and was shut down uh, due to mechanical limitations. And we have two belt press systems that continue to operate and have, have operated more or less continuously for the last eight to 10 years. <clears throat> the goal of these systems is to reduce the nutrient concentration, reduce overland transport of liquid manure. The effluent that comes off of these is very low in phosphorus, has low solids content, and, and is relatively low in odor. The solids, uh, are high solids, 20% solids or greater, very high in phosphorus, over 90% of the phosphorus ends up in the solids, uh, stackable and compostable. The nutrient composition here, again, not quite as rich from the standpoint uh, compared to the dry export that we're doing on the poultry side, but again, you can see that uh, the cake material, the solid, does contain uh, a large amount of phosphate compared to what the liquid does, uh, and it does provide us a, a good way to stack and handle the, the manure nutrients as a solid. Again, some of the benefits there, uh, it is an effective way of, of reducing phosphorus in the effluent, uh, very good at solid separation, very good at, at odor reduction. Uh, it is a mechanically intensive uh, process. It's also very sensitive to temperature and composition changes in the manure, so there are slight chemical changes will have an impact on your, your operation. And there's a lot of O&M involved. It does require labor, it does require uh, purchase and use of chemicals, uh, and because you're dealing with high pressure separations, you do see a lot of mechanical wear. So, uh, there are some challenges, of course, with this technology. And there's a picture of the uh, belt press on the left and the cake material on the right. The final system I want to briefly talk about is we do have a gasification system uh, on a turkey farm or a, or a series of turkey farms in the state. Biomass gasification is, is uh, a process by which uh, organic material is reacted um, but not combusted. And as it's reacted at a, at a relatively high temperature, or in this case, uh, what we consider more of a low temperature, um, syngas or produce, producer gas is generated. So what we have operating here in the state on this turkey facility is a star bear low temp uh, retort. That was, I think, changed out or replaced for a rotary kiln gasifier. Operates at about 600 degrees centigrade with an oxygen level of about 10 to 15 percent inside of that reactor. What that does is it, it, it uh, reacts the material, reduces the volume, and in the process, the organic material that's driven off in that volume reduction uh, becomes what we call producer gas, which is a mix of carbon monoxide, hydrogen, uh, carbon dioxide, other hydrocarbons, and some other trace gases. That gas can then be combusted in a thermal oxidizer, uh, with the byproduct being used in a boiler or air turbine to generate uh, steam and, and, and uh, electricity. The feedstock for this system is 35 tons a day of turkey litter. Uh, they do see about a 90% or greater than a 90% volume reduction, and they can produce 500 kilowatts of, of electricity and simultaneously produce 8,500 pounds of, of steam at 150 PSI. The steam and heat for this facility are used to at a uh, feed mill processing facility. So here's a picture of the gasification system that's in operation. The gasifier is on the far right. Just outside of that wall to the right is where the feedstock is stored, and then it's, it's conveyed into the, the gasifier. Oxygen is added into the bottom of the gasifier. Uh, the, the incoming feedstock falls to the bottom, and, and as it's falling, the gas is rising, and so there's some, some passing that goes on there. Producer gas or syngas moves uh, out the top of the, the gasifier into the thermal oxidizer, where it's superheated to about 1,000 degrees centigrade. And from there, we have high temp air that goes into the boiler and, and, and produces steam. Uh, that drives the uh, feed mill process. It can also be closed off and or also be sent through a heat exchanger. The producer gas, in, I'm sorry, the, in, in the thermal oxidized material does contain a lot of particulate, so they do run it through a heat exchanger that, that superheats air that then, then is used to, to power an air turbine. They can't power the air turbine directly with the, the material coming out of the thermal oxidizer because of the, the ash content and the, the impurities that are in the gas. So that's why the heat exchanger is in place. So this operation sits here just between the uh, feed mills, and again, they're processing about two large semi-truck loads a day of turkey litter and powering the, uh, the feed processing facility here. We don't have a lot of data on the nutrient content of the ash material. Um, it is dusty, and they are having some, some 
they've had a learning curve on how to utilize it. However, there, they do see a lot of value there, and uh, I would expect that in the next few months, according to the operators, we would see some, some information come out on the nutrient content uh, of the ash, but there is some value there. So conclusions, we do have a long history of environmental sensitivity uh, through both our voluntary and regulatory programs. That has changed the, the mindset in the state when it comes to manure management. We do see some adoption of, of some very innovative uh, techniques, whether it be direct land application, export, nutrient separation, or thermal systems. Uh, we've also seen some digestion due to this. Uh, and it's allowed the state to really have a healthy uh, and growing animal sector that's uh, continued to be a, a, a vibrant part of the economy in the state. So with that, I will hand it off to Craig, and I think we'll take questions at the end.